Welcome everyone who's joining our session. Uh, my name is Olivier Krischer. It's a pleasure as one of the co-conveners of the Sydney Asian Art Series with uh, Dr. Yvonne Lowe, who you'll also see on your screen. It's a pleasure to welcome uh, our first speaker for the series this evening, May Adadol Ingawanij. I'd like to begin though by acknowledging that and paying my respects to the Gadigal and Wangal people of the Eora Nation on whose unceded lands I live and work and I'm speaking from today, particularly um, I'm on Wangal land on the south side of the Parramatta River. A little bit about the series before I hand over uh, to Yvonne, who will be introducing our speaker this evening. Uh, the Sydney Asian Art Series since 2017 has been presented as a collaboration between the Power Institute at the University of Sydney, uh, the Art Gallery of New South Wales, and with the generous support of Viz Asia. And I'd like to begin also by extending a big thank you to uh, the generosity of Viz Asia and their ongoing support has allowed us to develop the series over now many years. We're in our eighth year, uh, which has allowed us, of course, to connect with international peers, but also share share this research uh, with a uh, general public interested audience, as well as many colleagues and students here. Um, over uh, this year, actually 2024 marks the second year in what is a three-year research agenda, which we've titled Kura, Collection, Community and Care. Uh, last year, we heard four presentations as well as some other events related to collection. Uh, and in this year, we focus on community. The Latin term cura is the root, of course, of the English word for curator. And through these, the, these three themes, the series explores multiple expectations, intentions, and responsibilities that animate and impact the work that we do in art research and practice. The focus of community this year will be explored by four international speakers. Um, and in addition to tonight's lecture, uh, we'll also be hearing uh, in May from Justin Jesty on the topic of community and care at the edges of modernity, uh, sharing some of his research into socially engaged art in Japan. Um, in August, we also will welcome Jung Jun, Jun Li, who will discuss black portraiture from the streets of Dongdu Chon, rethinking race intimacies and the visuality of the Korean camp town, uh, which is part of her um, book on post-war Korean photography, which has just been published. And in October, our Sydney Asian Art Series Scholar in Residence for this year, Tanavi Chokpradit from Silvercorn University, will be here in Sydney presenting against precarity, art collectives and creative workers unions in Thailand. Um, so please do look at the Power Institute page for the series where you'll already find more information um, and as well as links to register for those events. Uh, each year we also organize with speakers secondary events uh, and I'm very happy to announce um, ahead of our, our lecture introduction um, I'd like to kind of plug uh, an event on the 30th of March that will be held at the Art Guide in South Wales and that's a screening of five new moving image works which are cur curated by our speaker tonight um, and please check that out on the Art Guide in South Wales website which we can uh, share a link to in the chat. Uh, this is a webinar format, so in terms of our um, housekeeping, um, many of you will already be familiar. You should find a Q&A window at the bottom of your Zoom screens where you can post questions and comments at any point throughout the, the talk. Uh, first of all, though, uh, by way of introduction, we like to start with a conversation with our speaker uh, rather than a kind of uh, more conventional uh, reading of a bio blurb. And so it's my pleasure to hand over to co-convener for the series, Dr. Yvonne Lowe, who is lecturer in Asian Art History at the University of Sydney, who will introduce May in a short conversation uh, before the lecture, which will be followed then with a, a Q&A, which Yvonne will also chair. So over to you, Yvonne and May. And thank you once again, May, for being here. Thank you, Olivier. Thank you so much. Uh, we are very grateful to you, May, for coming and for sharing with us your ongoing research for a forthcoming book on animistic medium, Southeast Asian contemporary artists moving image. As May herself has explained, her research aims to creatively develop decolonial methods for studying histories and genealogies of cinematic and artistic practices and for conducting artistic and curatorial research situated in 
and related to Southeast Asia. And the talk today, I understand, is also part of her ongoing curatorial project, Animistic Apparatus, that has been variously documented and so far has seeded fascinating themes, one being that artistic and ritual practices are repertoires of agency for humans who are precarious. And this project is in, in itself um, a result of May's earlier study um, of the ritual uses of itinerant film projection around Thailand and neighboring territories since the Cold War period. And in this um, earlier study, May has already shown an interest in conceptualizing the role of humans as intermediaries in the cinematic dispositive in her broader consideration of conceptualizing animistic cinematic practices. So just regarding this May and very good morning to you again, I wonder as a preview to your talk, would you be able to share with us um, a bit about how you found certain, can I say disciplinary approaches to animism to be limiting, for example, in film theory and in art history, so much so that from your early study, that the one that is on itinerant makeshift cinema, you have come to this need or this proposal that um, of wanting or needing to theorize another understanding of animism as a kind of media or medium in itself. Thanks so much, Yvonne. Um, and thank you for the um, generous introduction and uh, the invitation to have me as part of your series. Uh, thanks also to Olivia and Nick and everyone. Um, so that's a, a really helpful uh, starting point to the conversation, um, I think. And by way of maybe um, giving you some biographical context about how I got to where uh, I am and what I'm currently doing. Um, in relation to that question about why I felt the need to perhaps go outside of disciplinary constraints and try to be as creative and have as much fun as possible doing the sort of research that I do. I think that was facilitated by um, one amongst many frustrations, but maybe we'll start with uh, dimension of my um, intellectual and academic life, which has been generative, um, which is that I initially trained in um, uh, film and cultural studies in a fairly traditional sort of humanities context, and then found myself working for an art school at the University of Westminster and working amongst colleagues, uh, researchers and students who uh, had uh, an openness to pursue um, artistic, curatorial or other forms of research, um, other forms of practice as a method of research. So I found myself in an institutional context where it was very sort of day-to-day uh, -day and natu naturalized that you would um, experiment and explore a multiplicity of methods and you would be pretty free um, to uh, adopt, if you like, a rather amateur approach in borrowing from or immersing uh, with disciplinary tools, contexts and references coming from elsewhere. And to do that as part of a method of working and thinking, which was very hands on, very much sort of premised on trying things out and doing. So that really um, very much is part of the very much a part of the reason why the way that I work uh, always um, combines practical methods and practical ways and always actually tries to experiment with different levels and registers of writing. Um, the question of why stray to, and I'll come to this uh, a little bit more in my talk, um, other disciplinary frames of references for thoughts, debates, research and discussions on animism, what it is, uh, what it could be. I think that one 
came out of a sense that within the history of film studies itself, um, there is a really sort of interesting and exciting tradition of poetically writing about animism, which was exciting because um, the early uh, film theorists who were uh, asking the question, what is cinema and associating cinema with a kind of animism that comes from the appearance of movement of all things on the screen. The poetics of their writing um, is very exciting and engaging um, to read, inspirational because of the freedom and creativity with which they wrote about what cinema is. But at the same time, over time, I grew to feel that this was a, a sort of primitivist conception of animism as the projection and in, imputing of uh, if you like an ontological democracy of livingness to all things, which perhaps in the present day and age, the downside of that is the tendency to maybe absolve human responsibility and culpability uh, for a range of things by imputing agency and liveliness to other things, other objects and other beings. So that was really, um, quite a strong motivation for me to then take the time to uh, immerse myself in particularly in ethnographic studies of uh, animism as contemporary practices in Southeast Asia. Mm. And a lot of that sort of fascination with how the, the anthropologists were doing it, studying it, then fed into um, the film historical work I was doing around the cinematic apparatus, the way that the cinematic apparatus was uh, was and continues to be used in outdoor film screening context in and around Thailand as part of a sort of animistic practice of communicating with spirits. And this you will, I hope, see uh, also as one of the threads informing the project um, that I'm doing and the thing I'm trying to write about, this book I'm trying to write about, which um, I will be talking with everyone yeah. about today. That's great. Thank you so much, May. Um, my second question, you've actually answered way because um, it pertains to basically your interest in, in animism, in cinematic practice, and then rethinking animism in contemporary Southeast Asian art, which I understand really goes way back and you've just explained how, you know, it was really you know, the beginning of your kind of journey your your academic journey. And I remember this really insightful essay from of yours from 2013 um, about Api Chupong's films that dealt with animism's historicity. And um, initially, I have wanted to ask if you might want to share with, uh, with the audience how you became interested in it as a concept and a problem. And then now you see it as offering so much, I guess, potential as a solution in terms of how we might perceive the region. But I also wonder that this might be something that you will address in the talk as well. Yep, so mm -hmm. we might just leave it um, as that. And then also to maybe spotlight a little bit your curatorial project, Animistic Apparatus, um, which um, I think you will also be discussing in your talk as well. So thank you so much for this opening. Uh, May, um, I think um, we'll have questions at the end of the talk from the audience. And so um, I think this is a good point for me to wrap up here and hand it over to you. And just a reminder to everyone in the audience to please um, don't be shy and do pop your questions anytime you wish in the chat box. Um, thank you, thank you, May. Super, thank you so much, Yvonne. Um, and yeah, please, everybody, I was just telling um, Nick and Yvonne and Olivia that uh, for me, when talking, the more improvised and informal, the better. So everyone, please do feel very free to help me out, um, pop some questions and chats uh, into the box and um, uh, jump in, um, Yvonne, at any time to um, maybe prompt me with some questions if. Uh, things are coming up that you feel is particularly relevant. Um, I flow much better that way. So what I'm going to be talking with you about today is, um, as Yvonne mentioned, this uh, research project that I've been doing for a number of years now, um, which has a curatorial dimension. I won't talk 
about that so much today, but I hope you kind of see how it tacitly, um, the project it, itself thinks curatorially and uh, practices um, curatorially. And what I'm going to be talking to you about is uh, the book writing aspect of the project. And with the book, what I'm trying to do is um, think about an emergent kind of Southeast Asian artistic practice that intersects cinema and contemporary art. And the book itself, uh, the effort is really to make a definition and to try to be as creative as possible in making this definition. So the question that my project asks is quite a simple one, um, which is what is Southeast Asian contemporary artist moving image? I'm trying to answer this question as a way to think about how precisely moving image works produced by Southeast Asian contemporary artists, which circulate primarily in institutional circuits of global contemporary art and art or artist film exhibition circuits how they are socially and historically engaged. By asking this question, the broader theoretical and art historical dialogues that I'm engaging in concern the afterlives of regional modes of artistic and cultural vanguardism. On the one hand, this afterlife refers to legacies of the Southeast Asian artistic and cultural avant-garde explored by many of the region's art historians, uh, people like Patrick Flores, John Clark, or more recently, Elikin. On the other hand, this afterlife of the avant-garde also concerns the way that genealogies of the artistic avant-garde in Southeast Asia are turned into heritage, and heritage is a term that I draw from David Josselet's conceptual frame in his book, Heritage and Debt. So you see here some quotes from uh, two catalog publications of two major exhibitions on Southeast Asian contemporary art in recent years. So what I'm interested in is the way that genealogies of the regional artistic avant-garde are turned into heritage or rhetoric of heritage for the validation and circulation of artworks within institutional circuits of global contemporary art. My starting point in trying to conceptualize uh, what is Southeast Asian contemporary artists moving image is to observe an aesthetic tendency within this sort of an institutional circuit of um, exhibition dissemination and validation. And my starting point is to observe that Southeast Asian contemporary moving image artists are making works that evoke animistic practices that figure animistic beings. So works that make animistic, aesthetic and poetic forms while engaging with historical and political legacies. My first example is the research led practice of film and media artist Ria Rizaldi. His 2019 essay film, Casita Ritz, so on the screen you see um, to the right, um, made completed in 2019 as part of Ria's uh, PhD project, which he recently completed. Um, this essay film explores the relationship between tin, mobile phone devices, and tin extraction on Bangka Island in Indonesia. So as Ria tells it, the starting point of this project is his learning that tin is an essential component of uh, screens and other digital devices. A third of the world's global supply come, comes from Bangka Island. And Ria tells a story of flying to the island for the first time and noticing that the island was entirely covered in mining sites. So the, the, the site, the, the, the top image that you see, this is how sort of mining for tin changes the uh, appearance of the island. Ria asked the miners what they were mining. And in the story that he tells, he says, and I quote, their answer was tin, and I answered, what for? To which they pointed at my phone and replied, our tin is in that phone. It was eye-opening for me. I started thinking about the material of tin creating technology and therefore information and therefore knowledge and all this entanglement leading back to the island. So in this um, research-led essay filmmaking project, 
Bria deploys artistic research methods of field encounters with peoples and worlds beyond his own, and a method of errant wandering around the island to explore extractivism as a key part of the Dutch colonial legacy, uh, and also of present day techno capitalism. Kassiterit, the film itself, in form, juxtaposes these dominant modes of tin extractivism in history and in the present with Ria's own projection of a desire to redeem uh, Orang Lom people's indigenous knowledge of human relations with tin. So tin not as an inert material to be extracted and traded, but tin as a life-giving source and a facilitator of reciprocal social relations. The cinematic form of Kassiterit associates tin with animistic presence, evoking the residual Orang Long knowledge of and relation to tin as life-giving. And the form of the film reimagines this through doing something with the capacity of the voiceover. So it uses the voiceover not in order to convey human presence and human voice, but the voiceover is used to associate with the presence of the AI as descendant from the tin being. So what Ria does is he uses the voiceover to give this sort of anthropomorphic sonic form to AI, calling the voice the AI Natasha and connecting this AI uh, with tin as uh, the AI's ancestor. So as we saw in the earlier slide, the institutional discourses of validation of Southeast Asian contemporary art um, heavily invokes the heritage of the regional avant-garde. Artworks and artistic practices um, within this sort of logic of validation are validated by association with the genealogy of this vanguardist assertion of artist agency in an arts role in revolutionizing society and in making the nation anew. What interests me in thinking about the practices of artists such as Ria is both the aspect of continuity with the regional historical praxis of artistic vanguardism and also the question of where or how a uh, Southeast Asian contemporary artist moving image might be conceived of as also a kind of uh, errant, uh, in an errant relationship uh, with the historic avant-garde. So this dynamic of both contemporary artist moving image practices as possibly inheriting from the historic avant-garde and also a gesture of errancy is what I'm interested in. So in these quotes from three of the region's leading moving image artists, we see something of the tension. Um, Wen Trinti, Love Diaz and Apisar Pongwira Setekun speak here um, to indicate on the one hand, the continuity of a long-standing tension of regional artistic subjectivity. So the tension between the imperative of art's responsibility to build or to rebuild society and artistic autonomy or agency. And T puts this very sort of succinctly and beautifully um, uh, in a conversation with cu a curator called Erin Gleason. She says here, as artists, we have contradictory desires to be engaged and also to disappear. This is a comment that I think about very, very often as I'm trying to do this project. So there is this long standing tension on the one hand that the contemporary artists are articulating still. And on the other, on the other hand, I wonder, the artist's articulation of this long standing tension raises to me the question of the consequences of continuing to grapple with the aporia of artistic social engagement. So what I'm also trying to think about is the particularity or the errantry of the aesthetic, express, expressive and enunciative tendencies of Southeast Asian contemporary artists moving image as a kind of socially and historically engaged uh, artistic form. How is the conceptual framing of animistic aesthetics or poetics um, 
helping me to move along with this task. Uh, the next two examples I'm showing you are from works from T and from Laugh. So the first one, this is T's essay film, an image from T's essay film, Letters from Kanduranga. And this one is uh, an image from Laugh's long film called what, From What Is Before. And the two works to me connect through their figuration uh, of the matriarchs. In T's film, the aged women workers in an area in the south of Vietnam that in antiquity had been part of the Jamba civilization are figures of the deep past. So in her essay film, they're figured as simultaneously the women workers of the present, and they evoke also the presence of the matriarchs of the Jamba kingdom. In Laugh's film, the cinematic figure of the grieving mother and also the matriarch, um, the figure is both the grieving mother and the matriarch connecting the present with the deep past. And this deep past is what the artist consistently mythologizes as a kind of indigenous uh, Malay, quote unquote. Um, Love speaks very sort of speculatively, uh, imaginatively and rather abstractly of his film being uh, an evocation of Malay time space, a kind of Malay time space of origins. And this sort of myth of origins that he's claiming or inventing with his cinematic practice is an origins of a post the origins to a post-colonial, post-independent Philippines that's in the dystopian grips of a murderous authoritarian regime. In both cases, in T's film and in Love's film, the artists are cinematically portraying the matriarchs as figures of connectedness between the present and the deep past. So the deep past before colonization before nation building, before the disappointments and dystopia of the present. And these matriarchs are portrayed in their moving image works as figures of ongoingness and as figures which obliquely gesture the possibility of exiting or of changing the present. This kind of figuration is to me an example of the tendency of animistic poetics in Southeast Asian contemporary artists moving image. As a formal strategy, the portrayal of matriarchal figures of the deep past evokes a cosmological and uh, I would propose another kind of futurist cinematic imagination. So not the kind of cinematic futurism that we might more commonsensically and ready, um, readily associate with the sort of images and aesthetics of futurism, uh, very high tech, very sci-fi. I think this is another kind of um, uh, uh, futurism that interests me greatly, partly because they don't look anything like what we usually associate with an idea of cinematic futurism. And maybe we can also think about this in comparison with historic vanguardist modes of enunciation. So whereas historic vanguardist enunciations um, in Southeast Asia emphasize the imperative of artistic leadership or the contributive agency of artists in developing society, in making the nation anew, uh, so in the future as the new or the renewed nation. The examples of T and Love's films signal a kind of futurism of cosmological connections, orientating to another future through reclamation of, through connecting with, with a heavy dose of invention, connecting with uh, an inventive deep past. And also in T's film, in Letters from Panduranga, what's absolutely fascinating to me is that the expression of this kind of cosmological imagination of connectedness, so a kind of cosmological world building, comes alongside a powerfully melancholic enunciation of uncertainty and doubt as to the social responsibility or the agency of the artist, the power of social intervention of the artist is something that this essay film um, articulates as an uncertainty to think through.
The next example I have is Abhijat Pong Virasetagun's video installation called Fireworks Archives. The site of Abhijat Pong shooting this work is a temple sculptural park in the upper northeast of Thailand along the Mekong River. Um, this site is called in Thai Salat Gyalgu, which is an informal religious space. So it's a space of spirit practice of some kind. It doesn't have official status as a Buddhist temple. Abhisapong is interested in the site as an archive of an imaginative capacity expressed through religious nonconformism. In this video installation, he juxtaposes images of this sculptural park archive with images and sounds evoking traces of revolutionary political aspirations. Uh, in the region of the Northeast. So also folded into the short video are black and white photographs silently presented and they're black and white photographic portraits which circulate uh, online of Northeastern socialist politicians during the Cold War who were killed by the state security forces. Um, at that time, Thailand was under a military dictatorship and they were killed and accused of being separatists and communists. What interests me about fireworks archives is its form of evoking these hidden histories of dissent and its ritualistic handling of the archival traces of the photographs and the sculpture park. Abhisapong presents the photographs as if they're part of a ritual assemblage like silently addressing spirits or making an offering to one's ancestors through ritual actions. When this work is presented in the format of an installation, such as this one here, um, an installation presented at Eye Museum in Amsterdam um, a number of years ago in 2017, um, the installation is presented in a space which it is kept unusually dark, so dark that when you walk in, you can't, you can barely see, you stick your hand out and you can barely see your hand. And in that kind of a space, in that kind of a quality of intense darkness, um, the evocation of uh, the space as a potent space of ritual, the sort of sensorial intensity of that comes out strongly. The screen used in that installation is a hanging mirror screen, which refracts the images projected in multiple directions, the space itself is incredibly dark. The exhibition space becomes like a potent place uh, where spectators are invited to experience this installation in a mode of uh, physical sensing of intensity and uh, navigating your way through this intensity of darkness, feeling very small and vulnerable. Um, in this potent space. Um, so you're not really invited to be watching the images on the screen as such, but you're placed in that space as if you are entering a time space of energy radiation and transmission. This kind of installation form, the installation form of fireworks archives seems to me to draw on a cinematic genealogy whereby the film projection technology becomes a tool for vulnerable humans to communicate with, to make offerings to powerful spirits. Animism in this sense is a practice of maintaining human spirit relations through uses of certain protocols, rituals and apparatus of communication. This idea of animism as practice of human spirit communication is another tendency of animistic poetics in Southeast Asian contemporary artists moving image. Uh, other examples of works gesturing the building or rebuilding of relational worlds through vulnerable humans communing with locally sovereign spirits include Apishat Pong's feature film called Cemetery of Splendor made um, uh, in a kind of couplet with fireworks archives. So the two were very much conceived uh, as being part and parcel of one another. Um, another example that comes to mind is 
to one Andrew Wan's video installation, The Boat People, and also uh, a slide which I showed earlier in the talk, Gorakrit Aruna Nonchai and Alex Kwakchik's painting with history in a room full of people with funny names. I'm going to skate back quickly to that slide. So in these artistic works, we see that humans commune with powerful spirits in the locality of a world that is living in the aftermath of catastrophe and a world threatened by destruction. In these works, humans maintain relations with spirits as everyday practice enacted through gestures, acts and apparatus of communication. Humans who are vulnerable commune and relate with spirit sovereigns or spirit powers as part of their world making, as practices nurturing their capacity to imagine living on and perhaps to orientate towards another future. In my effort to devise a framework to answer the question, what is Southeast Asian contemporary artist moving image? What are their formal, expressive and enunciative characteristics? In what senses are these artistic practices socially engaged? How do such artistic practices relate to the art lives of historical modes of vanguardism? What I did, as I mentioned in the conversation with Yvonne, I read around for ideas, particularly within the fields of anthropology, and particularly the resurfacing of interest in animism without, within Southeast Asian ethnographic studies. So within this really interesting area of scholarship, the works I found especially generative for my project um, are the following. So the first, um, the uh, edited collection called Animism in Southeast Asia, edited by Kai Arnhem and Guido Spring, Springers, both uh, anthropologists of uh, uh, Southeast Asian animism. Arnhem proposes that Southeast Asian animism is a kind of conceptual tool, a kind of heuristics, um, a heuristics for us to think about human spirit relations in hierarchical social contexts. Um, in this collection, Springer has a survey, a survey which emphasizes um, animistic practices in localities in Southeast Asia, uh, which he conceptualizes as practices of communication involving techniques and technologies of mediation. Um, other works uh, which were really sort of uh, formative to my thinking, uh, such as um, ethnographer Andrew Allen Johnson's work on people's world making capacities in a small village um, in the lower bit of the northeast of Thailand, so along the Mekong River in the lower bit of the northeast of Thailand. And his book is an ethnographic study of people's dreaming and world making capacities um, in this area through cultivating relations with opaque and powerful forces at a time when the ecology of that area uh, was and continues to be affected by mega project initiatives, um, dam building initiatives um, upriver. So his question is really to do with um, how do the people of the village um, speculate and imagine other future possibilities for themselves through practices of cultivating relations with opaque and powerful forces and through a mode of being and knowing characterized by the vulnerability of quite knowing of not quite knowing so the dialectics of um, uh, uh, not quite knowing and being small and vulnerable against the presence of far more powerful forces which are opaque to you. Um, how does that somehow shape uh, and inform people's imagine, imaginative capacity to speculate uh, on other potential futures for themselves? Um, other works that taught me a lot, uh, such as anthropologist um, Niels Buben's work on uh, supernaturalism, uh, and witchcraft on an island in Indonesia, 
And what he's uh, very attentive to theorizing is the supernaturalism's contradictory logic and instability or aporia as a condition, a possibility of people's agency. I also draw a lot um, on insights within anthropological research on sometimes what's called new animism. So insights from people such as Isabel Hermann's work that animistic practices are practices whereby vulnerable and precarious humans speculate on desired futures or imagine other kinds of futures. So in this sense, what these um, ethnographic studies are doing is to reconceptualize animistic practices as that which is futurist, which is future oriented, which is oriented towards imagining uh, uh, more livable lives um, for uh, the people themselves and for the locality. So not animism as a kind of traditional primitive or backward practice, which is um, how animism has historically been characterized within sort of colonial um, anthropological works and scholarship. Moving sideways in my reading into these anthropological studies um, have been especially helpful for my thinking about the question of artistic agency in the contemporary context. In comparison, both with the regional um, and perhaps we could say the regional masculinist model of the artist as revolutionary or as the developmental vanguard, and also the postmodern model of the artist as post ideological makers of urban public culture. We might say that in comparison with the historical vanguardist model of the artist as intelligentsia slash educator of the people and as agent of modernist temporal acceleration to the new or the nationally renewed, we find another model of artistic practice. The artist as a kind of offspring and descendant, whether through familial ties or through acts of imagining possible kinship and projecting slash fantasizing possible ancestry. Maybe we can think of the artist as a student or a seeker rather than a transmitter of knowledge. And we can see in the works of the artists um, that uh, I've introduced, the artist uh, also uh, is a kind of time traveler seeking to imaginatively connect the peoples and beings in the time prior so the time before the catastrophe and the betrayal of revolutionary aspirations. In comparison with the model of artistic practice as post ideological and therefore uh, effective, efficacious, a characteristic of Southeast Asian artist moving image practices is a reflexive approach to the question of what it is to be an artist and an understanding that the starting point of artistic practice or commitment the basis of valuing art is the powerlessness and the failure to actualize change. This brings me to my last um, taxonomic example of animistic aesthetics in Southeast Asian contemporary artists moving image. This grouping of works um, can be characterized as uh, a kind of animistic form or animistic poetics through perhaps a uh, more oblique uh, association. And an example here is Ho Sun Yen's um, extraordinarily research intensive artistic practice. So Ho Sun Yen's artistic projects uh, are defined by an expenditure of an immense uh, energy and capacity to inquire into the plural and the expansive historical worlds and also the chaos of histories constituting Southeast Asia as a region. What interests me about his artistic practice as a very resource intensive research intensive process of inquiry is that they don't produce legible knowledge and they don't reproduce codified knowledge. They produce something like the excess of knowledge. So time and again, Sun Yen's practice, um, what it ends up doing is it proposes or it enunciates weird taxonomies and strange classifications and associations 
out of this exercising and expenditure of an energy to research. In the video installation, The Nameless, the history of the Malayan Communist Party becomes turned into a taxonomy whereby the communist, uh, the video claims, is descended from the animist. In another example, uh, the durational multimedia project, the Critical Dictionary of Southeast Asia, what the project makes is an errant kind of dictionary that proliferates keywords associated with the region and conjures its future becoming not through the gesture of uh, an exercising of an epistemological technique of mastery, so not through making a comprehensive and categorical uh, definition of what is Southeast Asia, but through creating this very weird kind of um, dictionary of keywords whose mode of enunciation is, if anything, uh, ritualistic, whose mode of enunciation is goes via the sonic and enunciative rhythm of repeated incantation of certain words, of certain phrases associated with the plurality and expansiveness of Southeast Asia. So to me, Sun Yen's projects makes an enunciative gesture that is both futurist and errant. The gesture affirms the necessity of becoming through following the trails and the lines of an open-ended inquiry into the chaos and the flux of the overlapping worlds that is Southeast Asia. And in creating this kind of non-knowledge or an excess of knowledge, we could say that his practice strays somewhat from the historic mode of enunciation uh, of the manifesto. So the sort of uh, historically exemplary mode of enunciation uh, of the avant-garde, that communicative gesture of intervening in the social through the production and through the enunciation of the manifesto. And the last example, uh, an example that really interestingly parallels Sun Yen's uh, errant relationship to the genealogy of the regional avant-garde is Anotasi Wichar Gonpong's feature-length essay film called By the Time It Gets Dark, uh, which I put here as a work that exemplifies an animistic poetics that dares to create and to become with the vulnerability of not knowing. With this film, what Anoja does is she makes a film about inhabiting the media saturated afterlife of the massacre of leftist communists and students on the grounds of Thomasart University in Bangkok in October 1976. So what she doesn't do, she doesn't make a film about the massacre. Her film obliquely speculates the capacity of cinema to somehow become through the act of making an impossible film. Through acknowledging the impossibility of making a film about the massacre as the starting point of making her film. So here its enunciative form embodies a certain vulnerability of not knowing and the artistic uh, work proceeds from that starting point. In form, the film itself is a film of fragments, of shards, and of very, very oblique montage. What really strikes me is a communicative gesture that Anocha makes at the beginning of her film, which obliquely evokes the animistic ritual of communing with spirits, um, a ritual which is sometimes incorporated uh, in Thailand in the beginning at the beginning of a process of shooting a film. And this is a ritual uh, of commencing the shooting of a film by making an offering to the locally sovereign spirits of uh, the site that you're shooting on. In the opening sequence of By the Time It Gets Dark, we have a kind of gesture of commencement. And this gesture is a scene of a pregnant woman filmmaker communing with an absent present being. So by way of maybe tying up 
um, the propositions and the threads of my talk. Um, I'll wrap up by summarizing some of these sort of examples and the definitions that I've created in the process of um, introducing you to the artistic works and practices. We might say that the aesthetic tendencies of Southeast Asian contemporary artists moving image uh, are animistic. The tendency is to make animistic poetic forms in senses of uh, the relational as cosmological world making. Uh, in senses of futurism, not as an investment in the new or the developmental, but as a kind of time travel that connects the possible, obliquely possible future with the deep past. And lastly, as a kind of epistemology of vulnerability and epistemology of not knowing. And in that sense, decentering um, from and detouring from, or maybe even querying. Uh, so the modality of enunciation of the historical regional avant-garde. And in this sense, this is how I'm thinking of Southeast Asian artists moving image um, as practices that make animistic forms within circuits of global contemporary art. So the evocation of animistic practices of communication, cosmological world making, and future orientation are uh, characteristic features, I propose, of the social and historical engagement of contemporary Southeast Asian artists' moving image. Thematizing animism and evoking animistic figures and forms are contemporary artists' way of taking up the legacy of regional artistic and cultural vanguardism, while also maybe at the same time detouring from the underlying assumptions of artistic agency and arts e efficacy from the eras of anti-colonial and revolutionary nationalism or the era of uh, post-independence nation build building. These contemporary artist moving image practices are artistic practices that foreground the aftermath of revolutions and catastrophes as their long-term contexts or conjunctures, and that endeavor to meet somehow the responsibility of social and political engagement while being fully reflexive, fully understanding that their structural constraints of production and circulation are an extremely peculiar combination of privilege and precarity. The privilege here is the privilege of the global mobility and visibility of artists moving image works, of the artistic practices of a small number uh, of artists who are able to have that level of mobility and migrancy. The precarity concerns subjection to regimes with serious constraints on critical expression, and also secondarily, of practicing art as a way of living, relating and seeking in a labor sector that's highly mobile and prestigious for sure, but is at the same time hierarchical and extracts value from precarity of labor and the instability of prospects of artists. <laughs> nice yeah. to see you. Nice. Um, so it says here, thank you so much for your lecture. I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on the politics of errancy in Southeast Asia. Mm. I think I, the politics of errancy in Southeast Asia is, is maybe uh, too, too big a one for me to be able to handle. Um, but maybe I'll say a little bit more about how I'm gravitating towards using this notion of errancy. And it's really linked to my effort to think about the way that the contemporary artists whose works I'm interested in, whose works I'm thinking with, um, how to frame their aesthetics and their production practice as operating in the aftermath um, of regional vanguardism 
and at the same time detouring from and in that sense straying from the historical uh, model of practice uh, of vanguardism. So that's why to me terms like straying, detouring, errancy is useful in order not to set up an opposition between then and now because I don't think that is a way for us to understand um, the entanglements, the threads and the, and the characteristics of uh, the values and the historical models of vanguardism as both legacy on the one hand and as um, heritage on the other. That, you know, the, opera, the artists, contemporary artists are entangled in that. Some of their values and mode of operations overlap with the historical model. Mm. Um, to be seen as an inheritor of the historic avant-garde also enables institution to create this sort of rhetoric of heritage around their work. But at the same time, the practices themselves, I think what I'm trying to uh, think through and discuss in as nuanced a way as possible is our gestures of detouring departures and errancy from mm -hmm. the historic model, particularly from the sort of, you know, masculinized characteristics of the historic model. Mm -hmm. So that's from, um, that question was from Pixel, a if you have a follow-up question feel free to put um in the chat box as well um i don't know about everyone else but i've got rims of notes in front of me <laughs> taken from your lecture may that's been um incredible um i do have one um i guess a um a question pertaining to the definitions right um because i think um, where you're coming from, the definition of a certain concept or understanding or Southeast Asian artists moving image practice is pegged to the analysis of certain artists or select works of artists that you like and you, you, mm -hmm. use, you think with them. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel, and, and, and this is probably something that I also struggle with, like, do you feel that you need to examine a broad enough segment of works for you to feel that you might be satisfied with, um, with that definition? The <laughs> honest answer is no. Okay. And as, as, because I, my politics of scholarship comes in here and I think the politics of scholarship is around defining your terms mm -hmm. both in the standard sense of trying to define your terms with as much rigor and creativity as you can muster but also define your terms and dare to do it mm -hmm. okay. in a way that doesn't mean that you feel um in order to maybe ameliorate this niggling doubt of whether you ha have earned the right to be here and define your terms, you have to do the massive legwork of, you know, the, the, that imagination. Does the sample of work have to be bigger? Where does that come from? I think that comes from a certain sort of traditional mm. uh, social scientific, um, maybe, a social scientist will probably tell me off about this. Um, uh, anxiety about, you know, is, is talking to 40 people enough or do I have to talk to 200 in order to be able to say something? Mm. Sometimes there is a lot of value in doing it propositionally mm. with as much rigor and creativity as you can. But what you are doing is you are defining the terms with which you are going to think about something. Mm -hmm. We do have one question from Nihat, I think. Thank you so much, Professor, for your presentation. Could you clarify what you meant by historical modes of vanguardism? Quote, um, I've had some difficulty understanding what that means in relations to concepts around legacies, heritage, and animism. Mm. So maybe here um what 
I'm learning from particularly is going back and reading a series of works that particularly art historian Patrick Flores um, was writing a series of essays about 10 years ago now, and maybe the most recent, relatively recent one is the one in the inaugural issue of South East of Now Journal, um, which theorizes the regional characteristics and particularities of um, the artistic avant-garde in Southeast Asia. And this is, of course, in combination uh, with the work of John Clark. What Patrick Flores is, Patrick Flores's essays uh, particularly useful to me is the way that he challenges the idea which comes from theorizations of the avant-garde out of a sort of Western art historical tradition as that which emphasizes autonomy. So in Flores's work, um, the relationship between art social intervention, uh, artistic complicity in state in initiatives of nation building or state initiatives of modernization and development become much more emphasized. Um, and tacitly, I think the sort of, you know, the, the sort of masculine characteristics of uh, the Cold War era, um, artistic vanguardism, those are the kinds of insights that I'm learning from just returning to uh, reading works by uh, historians of Southeast Asia on um, the avant-garde, particularly during the Cold War period. And that's when I signal the historic avant-garde, that's the context of regional vanguardism mm. um, that I'm engaging with. Mm. Um, more recently, Ellie Kent's book, uh, which should be in my study somewhere, um, that's a book on uh, Somebody in this Zoom room will, will be able to remember the full title. Art and Ideology. It's a book on, on the ideology of art in relation to this sort of uh, the history of art in Indonesia as a his history of navigating the tension between the idea that the artistic avant-garde is art which, which goes out to the people um, and the way that that is in tension with uh, affirmations of artistic autonomy. So Ellie Kent's book is a study of the, the ways in which that tension has played out in different periods over time and the way that we can still see the legacies and the residues of that conception of that ideology of art in present day participatory artistic practices in Indonesia. I'm just putting it in the chat box. Um, this other question is a follow-up one from Pixel that actually follows nicely as well from Nihat's question, mm -hmm. um, which is, um, and he says, or she, um, they say, I understand the dynamic of errancy you describe as a tension with historical avant-garde. Is there a similar politics in these works in relation to non-art actors like the nation state? or global capitalism? The tension that um, I think is important to think through is around the artist's relationship of complicity and relative dependency and powerless, powerlessness with institutions that fund and that exhibit global contemporary art. I think I would, this is, isn't quite non, a definition of non-art actor, but I think that one is really important to think through. And that's why in my conceptualization, I have to remind myself, don't forget that these are works that circulate in institutional circuits of global contemporary art. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? What does that kind of, you know, structure, structural uh, uh, factor um, enabling and maybe also um, uh, in some ways limiting 
these works, what kind of forms, what kind of aesthetic tendencies um, does that create? So that to me is the kind of the structural dimension um, that needs to be addressed. Mm -mm. Uh, I've just been reminded by two that I missed um, that question that was posed before Nihat. So we'll quickly mm -hmm. get to that one first. Um, so two says, thank you for your talk. Could you talk about how to, to navigate resources for moving image projects in Southeast Asia, especially in countries where national mm -hmm. resources for art is limited and the resources are mostly from the Western institution? What kind of when you're asking about navigating do you mean um for instance doing a curatorial project to exhibit the works or do you mean um, probably cannot accessing scholarly scholarly resources to think with yeah so if we talk about how to navigate resources for moving image projects it sounds very much like from a curatorial perspective based on um, how it is framed in that question which is not something that you addressed i suppose in this talk from Direct my maybe this comes i can talk more from my experience of um doing film curatorial projects and one thing that I try to do consistently is actually to work with independent small scale or if you like to to work within a translocal network and alliances networks and alliances um, so one of the projects I'm doing at the moment is a film curatorial initiative called the Flaherty Film Seminar, which is a gathering of artists and people um, to spend time, watch nonfiction works together and discuss them. Um, and what I'm doing is, is um, both curating this year's seminar and also taking the seminar from its traditional base, it's usually held somewhere in the US. Um, we're taking it to the Thai Film Archive this year. So I think I use that as an example of a way to try to operate curatorially without being overly reliant on the institutional machine of global contemporary art that elsewhere I'm analyzing and you know, trying to think about. Um, I think it is possible to do that but it's more doable to do that if you seek to be embedded in a network of institutions operating with similar ethics and at similar scales um, mm -hmm. and you draw on the special capacity of moving image works to be mobile and to circulate um, so there is a way to work at a smaller scale on a lower budget in order to enable um, uh, curatorial projects uh, being done. Um, last year I was involved um, with doing a film curatorial project with a fantastic uh, film community group in Myanmar, in Yangon in Myanmar, for instance. Um, maybe I can give an example of that project as well. It's called Cinema in Transition, and it's a film publication and film curatorial mentorship project. Uh, it did get uh, funding, soft power funding, by the British Council. Um, it was possible to do partly in alliance with um, similarly scaled a film festival called the Berwick Film and Media Arts Festival, which uh, takes place in the rural northeast uh, of, of England. So I think those kinds of things are possible to do, but for anyone interested in doing that kind of a project, um, I think the sort of first ethical imperative to bear in mind is how can you work at a small scale on a low budget and try to be as equitable as possible mm. with the artists whose work you would like to present mm. um, and with you know, your collaborators. 
So I think small scale doesn't mean playing fast and loose mm. with extracting works uh, from artists, but small scale also means thinking about how we can all shift way of working and create maybe a parallel model, a parallel economy from mm. the sort of uh, dominant institutional circuit of global contemporary art. Thank you. Thank you. This is such incredible um, advice. And I'm sure it's coming from a place of being very um, inspiring to the audience. Um, we have one, we have quite a few more questions, actually. Um, one by Q.Y. Chu. Um, Chu says here, thanks so much for the fascinating talk. May looking forward to reading your book when it comes out. Wonder if you could also talk a bit more on the roles and agencies of non-human animals, plants, minerals, and so forth in the works that you discuss, both in terms of artistic practices of production and their re and their representations in the works. Thank you and hi. Um, for this project, actually when I talk about agency, um, I anchor that um, uh, in relation to the agency of humans who are powerless. Um, so I try to make a little bit of a distance from the conceptualization of agency that maybe emphasizes explore, exploring that in relation to human, um, more than human objects. So the, when I conceptualize this question of uh, aesthetics of the relational, the agency that I'm thinking about here is the agency of powerless humans as efforts to imagine a world in the cosmological sense. And a world in a cosmological sense means world of relating trails and entanglements and relations of human and non-human presence, certainly, but conceptualization of agency itself. To me, um, the work of thinking is to anchor that um, in human practices and practices of vulnerable human. Mm. Um, again, this is related to um, the avant-garde question. So with re with uh, relation to avant-garde to contemporary artworks, are there any formal characteristics or tropes that have become a apparent, a patron of defining animism mm. by RK? Mm. Well, a couple of things, maybe you can think about this comparatively, or maybe you can think about this via, you know, motifs of detouring, straying, um, uh, queering the historic model, and that's around um, the animistic aesthetics of contemporary artist moving image practices. Um, the sort of relational dimension there has maybe less to do with the relation between the artist and the people. I say that tentatively because actually there is maybe maybe the next comment we will touch on this and this is around sort of, you know, legacies of primitivism maybe. Um, but for now, let's stick to the sort of terminology of the relational. Maybe the relational here has more to do with imaginative efforts of world making and future making in a cosmological sense. I would say that that's you know, one sort of um, uh, a term where we can think the relationship, the overlaps and the and the straying between contemporary practice and the historic avant-garde model. Um, I did have a thought, but it's temporarily escaped me. Let me look back on my concluding remark. Ah, and I think I'm really, really interested in playing around with this idea of not knowing. So 
um, contemporary artists moving image practices as epistemolo epistemological gestures of some kind. I think that's another area where we can think track back and forth between, mm. you know, the historic gestures of the manifesto, the um, communicative enunciation of uh, intervention in society through knowledge creation. Historically, what form did, what model of what forms were generated with the historic avant-garde? How does that um, sit with contemporary practices such as Zun Yen, Ria, Anosha, hugely research intensive, and yet what do they do? They create errant epistemological forms. Mm. Yes, I like your why do they do that? Understanding of or a proposition artists as yeah. seeker rather than the transmitter of knowledge. Um, the next question actually follows up quite nicely as well by Kiru Ho you I probably got the name wrong, it's probably a nickname. Um, thank you for your brilliant presentation. My question is about animism on past as colonial. So if contemporary artists practices this animism, is it colonial hangover? And if so, how does an artist overcome this? I think we need to think that, not as a sort of sweeping statement, but maybe in relation to specific um, practices or body of practices. And also, I think to me, the task of trying to think creatively and rigorously is to be attentive to contradictions and ambivalences. So maybe in thinking about the animistic aesthetic turn in Southeast Asian contemporary art, the ambivalences and the contradictions um, that I need to think through would be around you know, which aspects of practice maybe has echoes with primitivism? And which aspects of practice um, counter that or suggest uh, another kind of model of uh, contemporary animistic uh, ethics or aesthetics? And I think around here, thinking carefully about terms such as primitivism, terms such as indigenous practice, is really, really key. More recently, I started thinking, maybe going back and immersing myself in that moment of writing on Latin American art around notions of anthropophagy, cannibalism, the sort of, you know, critical discourses and art theoretical and historical analysis of um, post-independence, mid to late 20th century artistic practices in Latin America, which sort of appropriates um, aspects of indigenous forms or metabolizes aspects of indigenous forms um, in order to maybe re-establish the term of, you know, the artists in society, the artists as privileged um, settler folks in uh, uh, society of first peoples. I, I think also maybe there's something interesting that could be learned in thinking about Southeast Asian contemporary art by also looking comparatively and looking at that precedent as well. Mm. Um, so in answer to your question, I don't think I don't think the way to move forward is to um, set up oppositions or make categorical statements, but I think the job of um, students, thinkers, art historians is, also, is maybe to be attentive to the tensions and ambivalences. Um, thank you for this. Um, we have, I'm just looking at, a at the time, uh, we have six more minutes and three more questions, which I think puts us in a good place. Um, this is from Mark Latbury. Thank you so much. Can I ask who, which thinkers, disciplines can help us, you and the art historical community, 
think through animism in art history. It is a term with a complex and difficult scholarly past, but can it be fertile? The body of ethnographic studies of animistic practices in Southeast Asia, it's very dynamic and a rather big one. I would really um, strongly advocate straying there. <laughs> and the other aspect which is hugely pleasurable to me about um, immersing myself in those works is also that the um, the more recent scholarship on human non human relations and animism in Southeast Asian anthropology, there's a lot of emphasis on good writing, good storytelling as a really key part of the method of research and a way to echo what, you know, what is the experience, the everyday experience of animistic practices. So much of it is around story making and storytelling. So what does the researcher have to do to be responsible to that? So just for the pleasure of reading good writing, uh, I would go there. Great, thank you. Um, questions keep coming. Um, Jennifer, we should, um, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll try and get through them for sure if we can. Jennifer, Jennifer Yang says, thank you so much. Thank you for your paper, May. Perhaps you have already touched upon this. I'm wondering if in approaching a definition, oh, she, she has answered, you have answered it, sorry. I will move on to um, an anonym, on, anonymous um, commenter. To what degree are the artists themselves aware of each other's practice? and their individual, but also collective shaping of the kind of Southeast Asian moving image practices you are theorizing with these animistic tendencies. To what degree are they, are the artists themselves aware yeah. of each other? Uh, highly, and I think this is one of the, the privileges of um, functioning through doing curatorial practice as well, that it means that I'm uh, this is you know, something very, very, very precious to me. So it also means it, you're more aware of uh, how artists um, relate to or talk about each other's work. So I think that the network is very strong, very tight network of you know, contemporary moving image artists in Southeast Asia. So awareness, definitely. Whether artists conceive of their practice as part of a movement, I don't know. And the work that I'm doing, I always say what I'm doing is I'm thinking with artistic works. And when I write, um, the readers that I have in mind, first and foremost, are actually the artists that I'm writing about. So in that sense, the work that I do, the writings that I try to create, it's part of my dialogue with the mm -hmm. artists. It's not a work of survey. Um, strictly speaking, I don't think I don't think of my work as a work of survey of you know movements or forms, and that's why you know I come back to this thing. Define your terms. What do I mean by that? I I mean it in two senses. Try to be rigorous, but rigorous, but I'm also you know, defining the terms by which you are exercising agency and autonomy of thinking. Mm. So your other curatorial project for which your book is very much, you know, drawn or based on, or in, I don't know, they must work dialectically together, the animist apparatus. Um, it's really fascinating to read because it's almost like a few notes of um, yeah, the book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and one of the texts that's part of that project is, um, you know, that's, that's a group written text. So we invited, one of the things that I did was I took about 40 people, many of whom were artists on a field trip. And then out of that experience, we made a group text. So that text was written by a whole bunch of people. I can't mm. remember how many, it might've been, you know, 15. Um, and then that led me to think, actually, there's a lot that could be done and that could be done with much, much more fun in well, what, what, what kind of forms of writing are 
maybe more generative to this kind of a project? Is it conversational writing? Does writing have to be something that you do on your own? You know, mm. why not we, write conversationally? We have probably time for just one last question and then we should really wrap up. And this is by um, Taryn Smith. I sense that some aspects of your framework animated Ruang Rupa's curation of Documenta 15 and inform some of the works, including moving image works, even though they were by collectives. What do you think? That's a very, very nice thought, but <laughs> maybe if only, I don't know. Well, thank you so much, Maisie. Has, this has been a real, real treat. Um, I hope that I, I hope that you have found this session fun as well and um not too um i don't know not to so. all the questions coming to you but clearly it's because the audience you know loved your work and we have a lot of questions for you in that regard um because we Very want to so. yeah thank you thank you so much to the organizers and and audiences and for such engaged questions it's 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 a real treat thanks so much thank you and um Thank you everyone for um, this very first session and for joining us today. Uh, we'll see you in a couple of months time. Thank you. And please come to the screening uh, yes. on the 30th screening. of March at Gallery of New South Wales. At 2 p.m. It's on a Saturday. <laughs> see you all. Lovely. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye.